Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lecture 2 for Chapter 17 for History 2023. Uh, that's Go West, Young Man, Western Expansion, uh, 1840 to 1900. Uh, in this lecture, we only got two topics we're going to be covering, and that's Manifest Destiny and the Gold Rush. Again, this is going to be a very high-level uh, kind of overview of things that are discussed in the textbook. Um, primarily, we want to, I just want to give you guys background um, for what's kind of going on with Westward Expansion. Um, now, you'll notice, I'm going to go back for a second, you'll notice the years here, 1840 is where we start prior to the Civil War. And that's important to kind of go back, even though it's after Reconstruction, right? Because we have, towards the end of Reconstruction and then after Reconstruction, we have an even greater focus and push towards the West. But that focus is there prior to the Civil War, and it's kind of put on hold. It's put on the back burner during the Civil War. And so when we see the Reconstruction, or when we see the attention again after Reconstruction, it's kind of picking it back up from the 1840s, from before the Civil War. Um, and so it's important for us to go back and get that that understanding um, of where we were before we were kind of interrupted with the Civil War um, to understand why people are going back West again after Reconstruction. Um, so that's going to be Manifest Destiny and the Gold Rush. So we're going to be talking about today to kind of get that. Uh, whoops, I forgot to change these slides, but this is Manifest Destiny. <laughs> So Manifest Destiny here um, is going to be something that is never an official policy of the United States, but it's something that's popularly used. It's a term that's popularly used by politicians and by people, by journalists, other people, to kind of encapsulate the American idea and reason and ideal for wanting to go west right now you'll see on the right hand side here this is a map of the united states and it's broken up by like the periods and the years when we acquire the land so you can see in the 1840s we had just acquired texas the mexican territories and oregon country so right before the civil war we've connected the united states through territories. These are not all states at this time, right? So um, when you get to the Civil War, California is a state because of the gold rush, which we'll get to in a second. But when we get to the Civil War, actual fighting is only right here because those are the only ones that are actual states. The rest of these are, they're people living here and they're American citizens, but it's not heavily controlled by the U.S. government because it's such a uh, vast territory that it's hard for people to populate and dense enough areas to organize themselves into a state. Um, and we, uh, it, it functions as a territory better, right? Because we're trying to sell off that land there, which we'll get to that in a second. Anyway, so we have this kind of rapid, once we start moving west from the original 13 colonies, um, we get it, you know, pretty early on after becoming a country and 10 years later, right? We, 1775 um, is when we are uh, kind of in the midst of that, that American revolution. 1789 is when we are uh, uh, writing our constitution. And so this happens pretty quickly after becoming a country, um, followed quickly again by these Southern territories here. And we just keep going, 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 right? Thomas Jefferson is our third president here, and he's the one that's uh, collecting all of this land here from Napoleon Bonaparte um, for a pretty penny, right? And so you can see even better here in this, this uh, chart here how quickly things are happening relative to uh, everything else going on in the United States, right? So we get the majority of our Western land, Louisiana Purchase in 1803. This literally doubles the size of the United States overnight, right? It's a huge amount of territory with not a lot of permanent settlements. You know, obviously New Orleans and places along the Mississippi River are, uh, but this whole middle area, you know, parts of Oklahoma, Colorado, areas like that are not dense and densely populated enough and not densely populated enough by French or American citizens in order to really build cities or anything like that. 
So we see the Lewis and Clark expedition. They chart out this whole territory. They actually get up all the way up here and find the Pacific Ocean and come back. Then we have Indian removal um, with Andrew Jackson, where we're your white people want the spaces here that are occupied by Native Americans. And so we move them west and we push them out into this territory, these territories here, to find permanent settlements for them. Um, we established the Oregon Trail, right? It's not just a board game. Uh, and that's a bunch of people continuing to move west, right? Because wh why? The United States has all of this territory and no one living in it. No one making money off of it. No revenue coming from it. No reason that's making it worthwhile to even hold on to this land. And so they start pushing people this way. They start incentivizing them to go out west. Uh, they are there are land grants so people the government is paying money to people to go and set up houses and farms and things of that of that nature there um and they're paying people to go and scout the land so just like lewis and clark but on smaller scales um there are people who are just taking it upon themselves and saying hey i'm going where nobody can tell me what i want to do and i'm going to go and i'm going to settle a colony and i'm going to settle or not a colony but a city i'm going to go settle and get people to come and follow what I'm, oops, what I am trying to say here. I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way on my clicker. And so that's why we get the Oregon Trail. Um, that's one that people are told, hey, Oregon, this beautiful country, this untouched area of nature, go here and make your home, make your city. Nobody's been there before. Um, and so we get a real big push that way. And what happens quick, quickly after that is gold is found all up and down the west coast here and a little bit into the deserts of Nevada, Arizona here. Um, the gold is had always been known to the Native American um, settler or Native American tribes that, that worked and lived in that area. Um, but once Americans and other nationalities, the Spanish, the British, find it, um, word quickly travels at how much gold is there which is going to bring an even greater influx of people into these areas, primarily into California, which is why California is able to become a state right before the Civil War, um, because it reaches their, their population based on this, the, the gold rush. So what we've got going on here um, is a whole bunch of incentives, both from the government and not, to get people to the West, right? Because what's the point of having this land, fighting for this land, dying for this land, buying this land, if nobody's working on it, nobody's living on it, you're not getting anything out of it, right? So it's a huge push to send people west. Manifest Destiny encapsulates that, but also encapsulates the idea of why the government is going after and pushing out Native Americans, Spain, Mexico, and uh, um, uh, Britain. And it's because the idea of Manifest Destiny is that the United States specifically was uh, ordained is not the right word, but was, was commissioned by God uh, to have reign and to have control of the territory, right, of North America, of the continent. Uh, and so this is, that's why anytime there's an opportunity to seize land, uh, the United States at this time never says no. They go for it, right? And even when there's not an opportunity to get land, they make an opportunity for themselves because it is their God-given right to have this land and to be in control of that land. And so Manifest Destiny is how we moralize ourselves into moving the Native Americans off of their ancestral lands into, you know, promising them, oh, this is the last time we're moving you until we want that land again. It's also how we moralize buying it outright from the French, taking it from the Spanish in, the, in, the, uh, in Mexico, um, and negotiating after wars that have nothing to do with those that land, taking it from the British. Um, and so it's how we put that moral compass on ourselves. And once we have gotten all of this land, and our land looks the way that nearly the way that uh, the modern U.S. does, that we can sit back and relax and we completed our destiny. We did what we wanted to do, but now there's no people there, right? 
This, so it's all tied in together here. Um, this is a picture, I'm sure you've seen something similar to this. Very Little House on the Prairie vibes. Um, this is a homestead, you know, uh, they are trying to, to move out west. There's nothing here, right? It's plain, there's no trees, um, depending on where you're at. So it's a very dire situation, um, meaning that they're leaving any kind of uh, convenience or creature comfort they had from the cities at this time and really striking it out on their own. Um, and so building whatever they can out of whatever they can. And so the way that the Western, Midwestern and Western states form is heavily determined by the homesteaders and the people that are going out there to buy that land. Um, so what does that mean? Places like California that are built and made out of majority of the gold rush people have a certain uh, way that they uh, operate and the way that they have formed based on the people, the population that's going there to, to, uh, to populate that, that area. Another example is Kansas, you know, right before the Civil War, we have bleeding Kansas because we're having an influx of um, abolitionists and pro-slavery people moving there to determine the future of the state of Kansas. Um, and so it's, it's at a time now where where you lived and what your ideals were, who you surrounded yourself with could fully determine the type of state and the type of representation and the type of development that that area would have as it progressed on. So let's talk about the gold rush. Um, 1849, yes, that is where the NFL team, the 49ers, get their name from. Um, and 1849 is the biggest year for gold rush in uh, California, not necessarily from the gold that they're finding, uh, but from the amount of people going to look for gold. All throughout the desert, uh, the eastern parts of the desert states, Nevada, Arizona, um, and mid up and down California, there are boom towns that are put up. These are small scale cities that are put up very quickly. Um, so they're not very good structurally sound buildings. Um, and it's for the gold miners, right? Um, so it's places that are outside of where the gold mines are. So you still have to go to them. Um, but it's a place where you can come and get your clothes washed, get a meal, have a lady for the night, um, have a drink, right? It's these, these cities that are built up specifically to cater for these miners. Now, it's an interesting subset of a population because at a time where women don't have a lot of agency and they're not able to um, really make decisions for themselves or have jobs or do anything like that in the civilized or populated areas off the East Coast, they come out West, just like the picture we saw in, on the last slide, they can make their own homestead, just women. Um, they could strike it out. Nobody could tell them no, right? In the boom towns, they are the ones who could own and operate a laundromat well, I say laundromat, it's not that fancy. They could be washerwomen, right? That they make their own money off of washing the clothes of the miners or of feeding the miners or of being the miners' companion for the night, right? Um, that is a very real career builder for women at the time. Um, now it has its own problems, obviously, its own complications, even at that time. But it's a way for women to claim their lives and have agency over their lives, right? And to operate within that system of power that's going on and, and, and on their own terms a lot of the times. Now, it also means that you could bring your slaves out here, um, that people would have that also existed here as well. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting dynamic of people because there are not that many people that strike it rich right that that it's similar to the lottery today when it gets up to the millions and the billions of dollars right everyone tries to go out and buy a lottery ticket but two maybe five you know not that many people win um and while we're only spending well depending on who you are you may not be spending that much money on the lottery today 
back then you put your entire life into it. You moved your home across the country sometimes, sometimes from a different country altogether. You put your entire money into buying the tools, into lodging, into um, finding out the best places, buying uh, insider information from people, right? Trying to find that untapped gold mine. Um, and it's not going to work out for the majority of people. But will what will work out is making money off of the miners in those towns, in those those washerwomen, in those cooks, right? Setting up banks, people who are selling tools. Um, a lot of businesses that we know today get their start during this time, specifically in the gold rush, right? And not as or because of finding gold, but out of selling to the people trying to find gold. Companies like Levi, Jeans, and Denim are first put out during this time. Um, JP Morgan Chase, banks, things like that, start to get their foundations during this time. Western Union starts to get their, their, their um, foundation during this time. So it's a very pivotal time, um, but it's not good for a lot of people, right? Not a lot of people make it out of that time successful or well or getting their dreams fulfilled right um especially for native americans of this area that lived here if you take my uh american history one course we watch a video um that i'll link in and here for you as well um just so you can watch it if you're interested um but we watch a video about the gold rush and about how um the Native American people are treated during this time and the legacy of that on the people, the Native American tribes of California, even into this day, right? Um, there are different government policies that are put in place by the California government um, that basically say killing and moving uh, Native Americans are okay if you're trying to find gold, right? It places this value on money and precious material over the lives of humans, right? Um, and so the gold rush, while we might idealize it, especially if you're a fan of Westerns, right? Uh, when we start peeling back the layers, it's a really problematic time. And so what happens is you end up with these areas on the West that are sparsely populated. And if they're populated, they're always populated by the best people um, of moral character, you know. Um, but also you are now full on the West of people who are disillusioned who are penniless, who don't have anything that they can do for themselves. And so how does that affect the West? And how does that affect the way that those states operate and continue to move forward, right? What kind of attitudes come out of that area? What kind of political leanings come out of that area? What kind of, you know, ambition and drive and, and, and innovation come out of that area because of the, the circumstances that these people are in, right? Now, the textbook goes into a lot more detail about everything I mentioned and a lot more in detail about things that I did not mention in this lecture. So as always, make sure that you go back and read that chapter, chapter 17. Uh, lots of good information there. If you have any questions about this lecture or anything that you read in the chapter, drop me a message in the questions forum or send me an email. Either one is fine. But that's going to be it for me today for lecture two for chapter 17. And I'll see you guys back here for lecture three.